Is our reality a simulation? An actual matrix? Can we finally prove there's life after death? And what about this alien UFO thing, really? There's a lot of cool, smart people working on this stuff, and I'm talking to them. Let's take the time to really explore bigger questions. I'm Ron James, and this is Bigger Questions. I sat down with physicist Nassim Haramein. Nassim is on the cutting edge of science and spirituality. We talked about everything from his take on the unified field theory, he thinks he's solved it, by the way, the holy grail of science, all the way to potential scientific explanations for currently unexplained and paranormal phenomena. It was a fantastic conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. So Nassim, again, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I think a really good place to start would be to just explain the unified field theory and in layman's terms so that people can kind of grasp what it is. Okay, well, um, you know, there's this uh, discrepancy in physics between the very large um, objects theory uh, and the very small objects theory. Uh, one, the very large being a relativistic equation, right, a relativistic theory, and quantum theory for the very small. And the two don't agree. Um, and so if for a long time, there's been a search, a way to unify the fields, to unify these theory, unify uh, gravity and electromagnetism with the strong, the strong and weak force of the quantum world. And um, the reason they don't agree is, in general, uh, is because uh, relativistic equation, relativistic equations, um, you know, describe space-time as a smooth continuum, where quantum theory describes bounded state of discrete packets, and so the two don't match. And the major difficulty in getting them to match is being to try to find an application to gravity, which is usually discussed in terms of relativistic equations, uh, inside the quantum world, like the effect or the dynamics of gravity to relate it to the forces of the quantum world. It's the holy grail of physics, or science for that matter, is to really arrive at a working unified field theory. It's been a, a long journey for me of uh, some 25 years of investigation trying to find, you know, what would be a unifying uh, factor between the very large and the very small. And I, you know, when I started, there was many physicists that believed even that they, there was no use to look for a unified field theory because there was, you know, just no way that we could have one model that could uh, discuss the large and the small at the same time. Yet, you know, the fact is, is that large objects are made out of small objects, like atoms. Right. And so there must be a theory that unifies them. And for me, you know, that was uh, definitely something I thought was uh, valid to investigate. And so uh, I looked deeper and in, in, I found something that was very intriguing. And they, the two things I found that were very intriguing was that um, at the quantum level, uh, there was a, in quantum field theory, there is a equations that shows that uh, space and time at that level is not empty of energy, is very, very full of energy, that the vacuum of the quantum world is actually a sea of energy. Uh, and that uh, the density or the intensity of that energy is very high. And in fact, when the equations were written, it turned out that the, the density of that energy was infinite in every point of the vacuum uh, structure. And so, um, you know, that had to be renormalized. And it was renormalized, or, you know, a cutoff value had to be utilized to get rid of the infinity. And that cutoff value was 
the Planck distance or this you know, uh, Planck unit, which is our only non-arbitrary units we have. Um, and it's a, it, it's a very, very, very teeny vibration. It's the smallest vibration of the electromagnetic field um, uh, that can go. Um, and so that they use that to renormalize this infinite energy in the vacuum. At the quantum level, well, I found an analog at the relativistic uh, sides of the equation where, you know, in relativistic theory, uh, when you solve for uh, gravitational masses, um, you can create, you can find that you can solve for a black hole, meaning an object that the gravity is so high that all the electromagnetic field um, gets kind of sucked into it. But when you get to the middle of the black hole, you end up with an infinity there, too. And that infinity, um, you know, space-time curves and curves and curves and curves and into a singularity that has an infinite nature. And, it, and then I found, again, that the cutoff value was typically thought to be the Planck units. And so I thought maybe there is a relationship between the quantum world and the um, relativistic world because of the Planck entity, the Planck units. And eventually, I found how to use the Planck units in a holographic solution to mass to describe both the cosmological world and the quantum world. Now, when you say a holographic solution, is that basically creating a formula that allows for wiggle room in the way it's applied, or does it close the loopholes? No, actually, it, 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 is, a, it, it is a formula that, um, that does close the loopholes and that you know, gives you a really, really good sense um, that the universe is actually a, a system of interactive uh, relationship, meaning that particles are not isolated from the rest of the universe, but particles are entangled or related to the rest of the other uh, particles. And, the, and these relationship between particles is actually what produces the effect that we call gravity or mass and, you know, the dynamics that we see both at the quantum world and at the cosmological world, uh, size objects, you know? And so, basically, uh, what I did is I found that if I took these little Planck entities and I tiled them on the surface of a black hole um, and then tile, tile them or stack them inside the volume of a black hole and I looked at the relationship between the two, um, the relationship between the ones on the surface and the one inside, uh, I found that their, the, the ratio relationship was equivalent in mass or energy as the mass of the black hole. So basically, I found a solution for black holes or for gravitational mass, a solution to Einstein field equation, but that was instead of being based on a continuum, was based on discrete packets of little Planck fluctuations in the vacuum at the quantum level, which is novel. Uh, yeah. So it simplifies the whole equation, and it also kind of looks beyond some of the previous perceptions and the previous conjectures. Exactly. It's like Einstein said, gravity is curvature of space-time. So imagine that you, you pull the plug in your tub, and it makes a vortex, and the surface of the water is curving, so your rubber ducky is attracted to the middle of the vortex, right? That's, in some ways, what Einstein described, is the curvature of space-time, like the curvature of the water in the tub. But what I found is that that's a secondary effect, because, in fact, the vortex, or the curvature, is the result of all the little water particles in the tub that are co-moving in that region of space that's making the effect. And so basically, as an analogy, um, you could think of 
uh, the solution that Einstein gave to gravity as describing that surface, which is fairly complex because, you know, it's got, it's like a tensor equation that describes that surface and so on. And what I found, which is basically, you know, a slur of these little plunks, which are teeny, teeny, teeny fluctuations of the vacuum, very, very small um, entities of the vacuum, all spinning together, co-moving together, like, like, a, like a big smoothie, you know, making objects like black hole and producing gravitational field, and the solution is exact. So this solution hasn't come all at once, right? You put a paper out a few years ago and you just followed it up with a very recent paper right. that kind of tidies up all the loose ends and, and really um, puts the package together. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my fir uh, I, I wrote multiple papers like um, uh, getting towards uh, that solution. And uh, actually, some of the papers I wrote earlier were very controversial because they were incomplete. There was a lot of loose end. And, uh, but, you know, that's, that's part of research. You may not have the whole picture uh, when you're publishing a paper, but at least you're publishing what you, what you found so far. And what I had found at the time is that if we treated the little protons as, uh, in the nuclei of atoms as mini black holes, as if they were teeny little black holes, like cosmological black holes, but very small ones, um, and we calculated the strength of gravity of these little teeny black holes, uh, it would be exactly the amount of force that we call the strong force that holds the protons together so that we could eliminate the strong force, which is in some ways ar arbitrarily, you know, kind of thrown in to make the model work in quantum theory, but actually that that force was gravity acting on the little protons. But I hadn't solved exactly how that force was working in terms of quantized solution to gravity for the, for the Planck level. So there was some loose ends, and I got very much criticized for that. And eventually, um, I, I, I discovered what I just described earlier, mm -hmm. that I could actually describe the gravitation or the mass of a black hole in terms of little Planck fluctuation in the structure of the vacuum. Um, and I applied that same equation, that surface to volume ratio to the proton, and I got the right answer for the proton as well. I got the right proton mass. Then when I flipped the equation, I was getting, you know, a very, very accurate radius of the proton. And so, uh, and this, that was really important is that I was able to extrapolate from the Planck slurry, you know, spinning together, making the little proton, uh, what the proton charge radius should be exactly. And it didn't match um, what the mainstream uh, proton radius prediction should be um, uh, by 4%. Uh, I was smaller than the mainstream by 4%. But I still made the prediction um, uh, because there was some measurements at the time that was indicating that the proton radius was smaller than what the standard model predicted it should be. And 4% might not sound like much, but actually the proton radius being off by 4% creates, um, in, in the standard model, creates huge a discrepancy in the standard model that are very hard to reconcile. And that's why there's been, like, you know, popular magazine talking about the problem with the proton and all this on their covers. Um, but when uh, they redid the experiment in Switzerland to measure more accurately than ever in, nine, in 2013 um, uh, the radius of the proton, then the measurement came in 4% smaller than the standard model and, um, and very, very, very close to the predicted radius that I give in my paper. It's within 0 0.00036 multiplied by 10 to um, minus um, 13 in terms of it's um, close to my prediction. So 
I'm actually, my prediction is actually inside the margin of error of the experiment. So it may be that the experiment is actually off by that little bit and my prediction is exact because I'm using teeny Planck entities which are very small units of measurement so it should be very precise. So that other experiment may uh, corroborate your work mm -hmm. and, and your formulas and your numbers. So let's just take a moment and say, well, maybe that's what's just happened. And maybe you have completely solved the unified field theory. Mm -hmm. People want to know, what does that mean to society and to humanity, to technology? And that's the next steps in your work. So let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it has a lot of implications, both in technological uh, applications, but as well in philosophical applications. Uh, in the philosophy, some of the interesting part of the equations is that when I calculated the number of Planck's um, as like if they were bits of information inside the volume of one proton, it turned out that the energy of all the Planck's inside the volume of one proton is equivalent to the mass of all the other protons in the universe. So that the mass of the universe is present in every one of the protons. In terms, of in, in terms of information. Um, I, and that really talks to the holographic principle. Talks to the holographic principle. Yeah, it, exactly. it reinforces it. Yeah, that like, that like it's really real. The universe is holographic and it's connected. It, it is one, like that the whole thing knows where everything is and that's why it can self-organize. So that's kind of profound. But, um, but in terms of technology for sure, um, if we understand now that gravity is nothing else than basically a vortex, a self-organizing vortex in the structure of the vacuum, then uh, we may be, in fact, in our research lab at the Resonance Project are attempting to do this, uh, possible to uh, rotate the structure of the vacuum and create an artificial vortex uh, create a gradient in the structure of space in that region um, to be able to produce gravitational fields ar artificially, um, which would lead to gravitational drive, space travel, you know, energy production. I mean, the, the applications are tremendous. Um, and, and it might sound like a far off idea, but actually uh, independent labs um, around the world have been uh, finding very similar effects um, uh, by rotating superconductive disk. Uh, uh, others, um, uh, for instance, the EM drive that actually got just tested by NASA where, where there's just um, uh, microwaves that are bounced inside basically a can, a, a conic can. Uh, and that's the experiment that NASA at first didn't even want to do because they were so sure it wouldn't work. Exactly. And then they were actually surprised to find out that it did. Exactly. I think that the inventor, uh, which actually is a really great engineer physicist, um, for 10 years couldn't get anybody to even test it because... Yeah, and he kept trying. Yeah, because yeah. It, it, it initially appears as it's violating the laws of motion because there's nothing coming out of the cone to push it forward. It, pr it produces trust just by bouncing microwaves inside this cone. And uh, the way the microwave bounce, they end up being more dense up front and less dense in the back. And it produces uh, forward trust, linear trust. And this, you know, it was thought to violate the laws of motion because nothing is being propelled out of the back to produce the, the forward mo motion. And when NASA tested it finally and confirmed it, um, in their introduction to the test, they mentioned that they're not going to discuss the theory on how this actually works, um, <laughs> but, that, um, but that the probability is that it's pushing against the vacuum fluctuation of the quantum vacuum. Uh, and that you know, it says a lot, is that, you know, there's more and more evidence that we can engineer devices to interact with the vacuum energy at the quantum level 
and get very, very interesting and um, actually societally um, changing uh, technology, you know, technology that can have huge impact on our society. Now, does this play into new potential sources of energy as well? Oh, absolutely. The energy level at the Planck uh, scale of the vacuum fluctuation is enormous. It's 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube. It's more energy than if I put all the stars in the universe into a centimeter cube of space. If I did that, if I put all the stars into a centimeter cube of space, uh, the mass of that centimeter cube or the energy of that centimeter cube would be 10 to the 55 grams per centimeter cube. So that'd be like some 38 or 39 orders of magnitude less than the density of the, all the plant that are in the space at the quantum level. So tapping only one tenth of a billionth of a percent of what's there would provide enough energy to run the planet for thousands of years. Now, does that potentially have interdimensional repercussions? Well, uh, that's hard to, to say. Um, you know, it depends what you mean by dimensions. Um, you know, th that's one of the issues that occur between, it, it you is. know, the layman's and the scientific community. Is the scientific community thinks of a, another dimension as just another Cartesian, you know, plane in the space, where, um, you know, layman's think of another dimension as this whole other world that's existing, you know, existing somewhere. And um, so if you mean that are we tapping in a whole other world? Well, I think the question th that I'm asking is that if we're pulling energy from somewhere, we're yeah. pulling energy from somewhere where that energy exists and is serving a purpose. Right, right. Just like when we pull oil out of the ground, it, we're taking a resource. Right. And so this resource, it obviously has its purpose in its place. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is, as we begin to discover this energy and even mm -hmm. broader, how we begin to discover how to tap it, yeah. is there a possibility that we're tapping energy that plays another role that maybe we shouldn't be tapping? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think so because from the equations I've written, I'm pretty well proving uh, and now confirmed by experiments, as I was saying, that um, you know, the material world, which is basically protons, uh, is actually this energy self-organizing in regions of space, you know, making little vortices. And literally and, infinite. Yeah, and, and, and but, but, but importantly is that if you're extrap extracting some of the energy from the space, uh, when you're utilizing it, you're putting it right back into the space. Uh, because basically everything you're doing is dealing with this energy because everything we touch, every, every, all existence, everything we see is, is this energy, you know, in very specific dynamic uh, relationship. So I think that it's actually probably the most um, ecological clean energy that could ever be uh, tapped. And, uh, and the amount that's present there is so enormous. And uh, you know, relative to what we could extract, what our needs were, it wouldn't even register on the universal scale you know, that we're pulling anything from it. So as, you know, let's imagine for a moment an advanced civilization that has mastered uh, some of these different types of uh, technology for gravity and for travel yeah. and for energy. Um, is understanding and mastering the unified field theory like an absolute essential building block to getting any further into these new technologies and new possibilities? I, yeah, I would say so. I think so. I, you have to understand how the world works in order to develop the technology, you know, to interact with it. And, you know, you might be able to discover it by chance in the corner of a laboratory here and there. But actually, to be able to travel interstellar, you know, across uh, stars interstellarly, inter interstellar uh, travel, uh, even intergalactic travel or, or interuniversal travel, um, you know, we gonna have to make sure, you know, you'd have to be able to understand the the dynamics that you're dealing with, you know, and and. Uh, the main thing you need to understand 
um, in order to do all these things is how gravity works at its most fundamental level. And, and we've never had that. We've never had a theory that actually, uh, you know, very fundamentally explained where gravity comes from. Meaning that Einstein told us that it was the result of space-time curving, but didn't quite this, you know, didn't explain uh, what is space-time, and you know, and and so it's it's not clear what exactly gravity is in the standard model. Uh, and these new equations actually gives us a glimpse into, into what gravity really is. We were talking earlier before we started taping, and we were talking about some previously well uh, accepted ideas like um, quantum interference and um, the, you know, things that are happening inside plants, which I thought was really exciting, quantum photosynthesis, where the idea that the uh, photon is moving through every possible route of the plant uh -huh. in, in a quantum situation and then collapsing back into reality uh -huh. once it finds its most efficient path. Yeah. Um, how do these theories, um, you had mentioned that maybe some of these ideas have previously been interpreted in an incorrect way as right. it applies to, to the mathematics that you've come up with. Yeah, Just tell us a little I, bit. Yeah, I think that there's a, there's a view that's developing more and more around the world that, um, you know, some of the early interpretation of experiments in quantum that, that were at the base of quantum theory and quantum weirdness, you know, like all these... Interference phenomena. Yeah, yeah like yeah. the superposition of wave particles and so on. Um, may actually be misinterpretation of certain mechanics that were not understood, which, you know, Einstein, till the day he died, believed that, you know, there must be a different solution than the, the interpretations that were done in Copenhagen, for instance, of the double slit experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and, and people would say, but, but how, how can that be? We get, we get such accurate answers from sure. the theory we have today. You can get the right answer with the wrong theory. Um, a good example is um, before the heliocentric uh, solar system was uh, found, uh, we had the geocentric uh, solar system where the, the, where the Earth was at the center of the solar system. And we could go out there with the geocentric solar system model uh, although the, orbit the orbitals looked like a bad hair day, we could still pinpoint with very good accuracy, um, you know, where s planets should be at what time, you know, during the day or night and so on. And so it gave the right answer, it just was the wrong model. And um, uh, usually when you, when you find the right model, it's much simpler than the model that may not have been accurate. And so, for instance, um, the double slit experiment uh, can be explained uh, without the need for um, quantum weirdness where particles can be, you know, are in superposition state and so on and, and can be particles and waves at the same time and right. all this stuff. Um, you can actually describe all the dynamics that are, you know, measured in the double slit experiment with fluid dynamics. And that has been shown in laboratories in France and MIT now, that uh, you can take a back of, um, of fluid, typically it's a silica, uh, and uh, put little silicone beads on it and vibrate the, the, the back, and this would be the vacuum fluctuation at the, that are vibrating in the space. And the beads, you know, um, that will, will walk across the water and create the same effect, the same, or across the, the silica uh, uh, fluids, um, and create the same effect that we see in the double slit experiment. Because, um, think about it this way, if the particle is moving and you assume it's in nothing, then you need all this quantum weirdness to be to able explain it. to explain it. But if the particle that's moving is actually in a, in a, a superfluid field, right, and it's making waves, 
uh, then it can be a particle and a wave at the same time, but it's not some esoteric thing that you can't visualize. It's uh, basic mechanics, right? And, and that is really uh, insightful, and, it, and it's gaining a lot of, um, of support in the scientific community um, that maybe there was some misinterpretation of quantum theory early on that led us kind of down uh, a very strange path. And so, for instance, the fact that particles may go through all possible paths before they go to the, the most um, probable one, um, the, uh, and the collapse of the waveform and all this, may be actually just because of this holographic structure of space-time in which all information is present in every point. And so, it, you know, because of that, it appears that the, that the information is moving through all possible paths in the universe and that the probability of it being over there is in relationship to all these probable paths. Um, but it, it's not because it's some weird, um, you know, probability universe that's running under random, random function. It's actually a highly organized universe in which information is highly uh, coherent across huge scales, and you know, the, but the coherent and accessible and it, accessible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's a complete different view of the universe that developed. Kind of takes all the fun out of quantum theory. I mean, when there was this big <laughs> mystery that we couldn't figure out, no, oh, it must be doing all this stuff that we can't explain and defies all logic and makes it so we can't write a unified field theory. It was kind of fun. But right. Well, I mean, I think it, it might take some of the fun out, but it gives us some profound understanding of, of the universe that, that actually the universe is, is unified. It's, it's all one, and it's talking to itself, and that's how it self-organizes. So let's talk about how consciousness plays a role in really understanding a working unified field theory because, you know, traditionally neuroscience would say that consciousness dies in the brain and um, sci that was the scientific viewpoint for a long time. And I think even in schools where they're teaching the next generation of neuroscientists, they are open to the idea that consciousness exists in some form of larger holographic container. Right. And so, um, how does that all play out in your work? This self-organizing uh, network of information um, is kind of necessary to explain anything biologic. So like for instance, in current quantum theory or in relativistic equation for that matter or any physics that's out there, no biological systems can exist. Like there's nothing in those theory that describes anything that has anything to do with biology, meaning like nothing in this theory predicts that biology should emerge. In fact, this theory predicts that the probability of biology to emerge is almost nil, you know, because even the most simple uh, monocellular system is too complex in it, in, for it to occur from random functions. Um, you know, the probability of that happening are almost zero. Um, and so um, it actually started to tell us that there, this field that is self-organizing because it has feedback, it knows what it's doing, it, the information is shared across all scale, um, that actually, uh, you know, the brain and the biological entities are actually tuned into it um, so that the brain or the body, the, what I like to think of as the bio-oscillator, uh, is actually not the source of the consciousness, but like an antenna. Right. Tapping into the field of information and tuning in to a very specific frequency, you know, because we're all a little different. Sure. And do downloading, basically, the... Uh, the information from the field and then by it by interpretation and by it, it action uh, making you know feeding the information back into the field so basically a very clever matrix i mean it's it, it i i've often said that 
the, you know, the manifestation of this physical reality that we have here and the way we're beginning to create convincing artificial worlds as we advance in technology are showing us that, you know, with the Turing principle that maybe, you know, it was the possibility of being able to create convincing artificial worlds and then plug our consciousness into them, um, if it does exist, if it's possible, then it does exist somewhere and maybe we're in it right now. Right. The, the idea that we're, we're proving more and more, and now through really solid scientific advancement, the illusionary nature of the universe and the existence of consciousness or even intelligent design, right. um, th that is a subject that totally fascinates me. And uh -huh. it just it is very rewarding to me to see your work bringing this stuff together. It's like taking it to the next step. There's yeah. a lot of guys out there saying that this is happening, the fusion of science and spirit, so to speak. Right. And there's a lot of scientists that are opening up to some, some of these ideas. Right. But I really feel like what I've heard you say and what I've researched about you, you're kind of on the cutting edge of really being able to prove this stuff and unite it all. And that's very exciting. Oh, thank you. But yeah, and uh, you know, it's really remarkable as well from what you were saying that like, you, um, in this new view of the, of the event of consciousness is no longer just um, because it's in the field, right? And, and since matter is actually made out of that field, you can't actually anymore differentiate, differentiate where uh, consciousness is not and where consciousness is. The whole thing is actually learning about itself and building larger and larger complexity and eventually you know producing a human being that's looking back at itself and saying how did i get here right but it's actually that the whole thing is conscious the whole universe is is um you know building the dynamics to eventually have you know a self-aware entity on the end of it so it, 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 it really gives you a sense of uh, unity and connection with the rest of the universe. So when we live in a society where the interconnectivity of all things has pretty much been proven as a scientific fact, it's no longer debated. You know, like nobody debates gravity or blue sky, but people still might debate whether or not we're alone in the universe or rather we survive death. Mm. When this knowledge is cemented into the collective human psyche, how does that change our civilization and our society? Well, you know, it changes it uh, fundamentally. As I was saying earlier, you know, when we have gravitational drives, uh, everything changes very quickly. For instance, it's no longer an issue for you to go and jump into your levitating car and, you know, go and spend a weekend orbiting Jupiter. Um, you know, it, it, it's no like all of a sudden the resources available to our planet becomes extremely uh, available like such as uh, you know um, the asteroid belt you know uh, being able to mine there or to get resources from other planetary systems or or to establish colonies on Mars like uh, Elon Musk and uh, Mr. Branson's are talking about doing with rockets uh, all of a sudden you know, going in orbit, like basically our society will be able to live off planet and in our solar system, even maybe in our galaxy. Um, it's a completely different ball game. And, and give the, black, the planet back to, um, to nature so that nature can reestablish um, a sustainable and healthy uh, relationship on the surface of our planet. So, you know, it may be that planetary systems are only little incubators for, you know, life, and that um, eventually the people on, the, on, the, on those kicked worlds... kicked out of the nest. Yeah, they have, they have to learn to fly because the nest is getting too small. And no matter how big the planet, there would be a moment where that occurs. And the only way to actually um, practically, you know, being able to have a world off the surface, uh, you know, an off world uh, in space um, would be with the control over gravity, not by uh, burning massive amount of fuel in uh, rocketry kind of devices. Those are kind of, you know, the devices of the earlier evolution. 
So I think this is, um, this is very exciting, Many, as I said. Um, and, and as well, as soon as we start getting out there in the solar system, or even in our galaxy, if we have gravitational drives, uh, we might encounter other life forms that have maybe achieved those uh, gravitational capacity thousands of years prior to us. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that on our planet uh, today that, uh, you know, they might have been some of the, the sightings, uh, you know, of some of these um, advanced civilization being able to fly around our planet and so on. So, you know, we might uh, enter a larger community, uh, maybe a galactic community or a universal community that might have their own rules and regulations and so on. And so it might open our world to a whole new horizon of interaction with the universe. So that's a way in which these advancements might enable us to reach out. But there's also a whole other concept of how they're going to enable us to further reach in. Mm. Uh, in other words, can you see a time when we're able to actually create for ourselves convincing realities for us to dwell in? They say like we create our own reality now, and to a point, I can see that. There's certain limitations, but we certainly create our own experience, and maybe even as far as being very instrumental in creating and manifesting the physical world, but this enables us to go much farther, um, to literally become just like plugged into your own imagination and not even need a physical body anymore. Is there, is, is there a way that this goes in that direction that really just enables us to literally be our own creators? Yeah, well, you know, the sky's the limit when you're engineering the structure of the vacuum itself. If, if this is all correct and the vacuum energy is the source of the material world and we tap into it, then, um, you know, the, we, there's no reason that at one point or another we shouldn't be able to actually create matter directly out of the vacuum and, and create objects like like the concept of the replicator, you know, in Star Trek and so on. I mean, that may be possible. Uh, and, you know, science fiction has always been ahead of, of science, but eventually science catch up to the science fiction world. And so, um, you know, if we start engineering the vacuum, and, and it's remarkable, you know, at the end of the day that this is not an... Uh, you know, a field of investigation that is being supported financially with, you know, all the might that the, that the, the industry out there could, could give to and the governments because it should be one of the most important, um, you know, investigation uh, that's going on on our planet today because it has Absolutely. the potential to make a huge difference in our capacity to survive the years to come. So. You know, I think that as soon as we start being able to engineer, and we are starting, you know, as I was saying, there's devices out there that are showing um, elements of it. Um, we are going to be able to do things that are probably unimaginable today, including teleportation, maybe a possibility. Time uh, travel? Time travel, uh, all sorts of application, and certainly uh, warp drive. Sure, NASA's working on that right now. Yeah, when NASA is working on it, on, on the principle of using the vacuum fluctuation to produce the energy to warp space-time enough to produce a warp drive. So it's not so fringe anymore. When I, when I started in this whole investigation and, and trying to bring these theories forward 25 years or 30 years ago, this was very, very fringe, um, you know, topics. Um, but nowadays, people are really, you know, catching up and uh, it's becoming in more and more mainstream. So, you know, speaking of fringe, one of my favorite things that I like to explore is how new scientific, new scientific advancements could potentially give us new explanations for paranormal phenomenon, like ghostly phenomenon and, mm -hmm. and some of these other things that are happening, especially some of the ghostly stuff that happens, electronic voice phenomenon the seeing of apparitions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about how science and paranormal may one day be able to reconcile and the paranormal might be normal after all? Right. 
um, that's, that's very good. I always say that um, what we think of as um, spiritual or esoteric events and so on are most likely the physics we don't understand yet, right? And um, I think you're right. I think, uh, again, returning to this fundamental field of information, if, um, if a biological structure is actually a set of information that um, is held in the field, in the vacuum field, there's no reason why this, um, when the atoms, you know, decohere and your body goes back to the earth, that the field of information that was your consciousness, if you like, um, is not able to continue in the structure of the vacuum, which would explain like ghosts and, you know, life after death and all these things as well. You know, uh, things like remote viewing becomes understandable. Uh, if, if every point contains all the information of all other points, then if you access one of the hubs of the structure of the vacuum, you should be able to have information about a place that you've you know, never been to on the other side of the world or whatever in, in a remote viewing session or so on. So, you know, all of a sudden remote healing, you know, all these type of things. Um, uh, start to uh, may have, you know, a explanation in terms of the mechanics and the physics that the universe uh, is built with. And all of a sudden, it's not just some woo-woo thing, uh, uh, but it's actually something that's um, in the natural world, as you, as you were saying. Now, I know we're getting short on time, so let me just ask you the final question. Um, after potentially helping to solve one of the biggest scientific riddles in human history, what's next for you? Tell us about what you're doing in Kauai, the Resonance Project, and where your work's going now. Well, uh, certainly one of the things that's really important is that the people know about it. And educating the public is a very big part of the Resonance Project Foundation. And so we've launched a delegate program online which is a 12 weeks program that goes through all, through six modules, uh, some 400 pages uh, of media and written material and so on and reference so that people can go through all the information step by step at the rhythm that they are comfortable with and they can research and dig in and go as far as they want down the rabbit hole. Um, so that's really exciting. And, and there's a movie too. Oh yeah, there's a movie that's coming out called The Connected Universe, uh, and uh, we're really excited about it. The, um, we did a crowdfunding campaign for um, some of the animations in the movie, and uh, it was one of the most successful crowdfunding campaign for you know a documentary ever. Uh, and so that was really remarkable. People are really interested. People really want to know at this point and, and they feel like there's a new story that's emerging and, and they want to support it. And so there's that going on and then of course we're working on technological development in our laboratories. Uh, we're setting up uh, as well an uh, internship program so that people can come to the Residence Project and spend six months and learn with us and so on. So there's a lot going on and if people go to resonance.is, I-S, resonance is, um, they can see all of these different projects that are going on. That's awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I know you need to get back. I think that uh, one of the most important thing that um, I like to convey to people if, uh, if uh, they are a layman is that this new science, this new physics, are telling us that we're actually incredible beings with you know, every atom, every proton in our body with inf incredible amount of information and that we can tap that information if we actually go within, if we actually go towards the center of our, of our being. And maybe that's why all these ancient civilization talked and these masters talked about meditating every day and so on. And, and that's a good thing for us to do. Like, self-reflection in any way that you can, that you feel like is appropriate to do it, uh, I think can lead to actually a direct contact with that field of information that drives all of creation. Well, you know, just like the unified field needs to work, uh, and 
somehow it just has to, right? You can't have a, a, a reality with a broken formula because then we'd have a broken reality. Right. The reconciliation of science and the reconciliation of the spiritual philosophies that we know to be true just on our inner knowings, that all has to work at some point too. Right. It can't be at odds, it can't be in a situation where it doesn't reconcile. So the unified field theory of humanity may be much closer at hand because of the work that you're doing. And I thank you. Oh, thank you very much, I appreciate it.